My name is Glenn Weil, and today I'm going to be talking about concordance among holdouts, which is some joint research with Scott Duke Commoners, who's a graduate student here at the Harvard Economics Department and Business School. And as the paper's title suggests, it's about the holdout problem that is thought to exist, uh, for example, when the government tries to buy land uh, to build a bridge or uh, a military base. Um, the potential sellers of that land are often numerous, even if the government wants to build only one contiguous uh, project on that land. And they therefore have an incentive to um, potentially refuse to sell their land unless they receive for it a large fraction of the total gains from trade that all of the sellers and uh, the government uh, receives from that sale. Um, and this can really wreak havoc and make it very difficult uh, for the land to be purchased if every seller is acting in this way. And that's the reason why we have institutions such as eminent domain that allow the government to uh, purchase that land without uh, obtaining the consent of all of the sellers. And these sort of problems arise not just in land assembly problems, but in many other contexts, such as corporate acquisitions, uh, the recent attempts by the Federal Communications Commission to try to reassemble parts of the spectrum to facilitate more efficient uh, Wi-Fi and many other settings. Um, in fact, in a little back of the envelope calculation that I'll discuss in just a little bit more detail later, uh, we estimate that the net present value of the deadweight loss associated with the holdout problem is on the order of about 10% of GDP or several trillions of dollars. Um, but the kind of perhaps surprising thing is despite how important this problem is to the economy uh, and despite how bad the problems we know that can arise if we don't have good institutions for dealing with it are, um, the institutions we in fact have and that are used and in fact even those that have been proposed are quite primitive. So um, the typical uh, way in which the holdout problem is dealt with is either some sort of takings procedure like eminent domain where the land is simply taken from the individuals and they're paid some amount of compensation that's determined uh, by some formula like the assessed value of the land or um, the sellers are allowed to vote on whether to accept an offer with some threshold determining whether a sale takes place or not as is typical in corporate acquisitions. And I think this is really a telling contrast with auctions where there's an enormous literature in economics on how to optimally design auctions um, in order to promote efficiency, to raise maximal revenues, uh, and so forth. And some quite elaborate uh, mechanisms have been derived uh, for dealing with the auction problem. And I think we're going to argue that part of the reason why that's the case is that the auction literature has drawn on a very rich tradition in um, the theory of competition to try to, uh, and the theory of industrial organization, to try to devise auctions which uh, most effectively foster that sort of uh, competition. Um, and, and that's a tradition that really goes all the way back to the work of Cournot in the early 19th century. Um, but one thing that is less well known is that, in fact, Cournot also thought quite a bit about something which is very analogous to the holdout problem, namely um, a situation in which there are many different producers of goods which are perfectly complementary in consumption, and each of the producers has a monopoly over those goods. Um, and in fact, uh, Cournot's thinking about how to deal with that problem has not really been applied to um, trying to solve the holdout problem in the way that his uh, thinking about competition and the literature that that uh, launched on competition have been applied to understanding uh, the right way to design auctions. Um, and yet, the basic Cournot's basic analysis, as we'll argue, indicates that in many ways, the design of a market for the holdout problem is much more important than it is for the auction problem. Cournot's famous theorem shows that as the number of competitors 
gets large, efficiency obtains even in really quite naive ways of setting up a market. And so it's not really that important exactly how you design an auction as long as there's sufficient competition and not too much collusion. On the other hand, in the holdout problem, we know that as the number of firms grows large, unless we design the market exactly, uh, the number of sellers grows large, unless we design a market exactly correctly, there's going to be this terrible problem and it's going to be basically impossible for any sales to take place. Um, so uh, we think that in many ways it's much more important to design markets properly for the holdout problem and yet there's been very little attention given to it. And um, what I'm, we're going to try to do today is to draw upon this um, tradition of uh, Corneau's thinking uh, and some of the ideas that have followed on it to do two things. First, to try to enrich our understanding of the holdout problem and to try to draw attention to it within the market design community, uh, basically by unifying a bunch of different strands of literature, connecting them back to Corneau's understanding of these problems, um, and using that as a way to kind of frame uh, this problem as a um, agenda in, mechanism, in market design. And second, we're going to, um, again, draw on Corneau's insights to propose a class of solutions to this problem, which we think um, are appealing uh, and have some strike a good balance between preserving the property rights of the sellers and achieving efficient sales. So I'm going to do a few things today. First, I'll um, briefly review uh, Corneau's theory and the literature that's followed on it to provide a frame for understanding the holdout problem. Uh, second, I'll um, make that a bit more precise by presenting a general model of the sort of situation that I'm thinking about. Um, and then I'll propose our general solution, uh, which we call the concordance principle, which is named after Corneau's theory of um, complementary monopoly, what he called concours des producteurs, uh, or collaboration among producers, uh, as opposed to concurrence des producteurs, which is competition among producers. Um, I'll then uh, talk about some applications of this principle to land assembly and some of the other problems I was talking about. Um, and then make the broad principle uh, that's the foundation of all the mechanisms we're proposing a bit more concrete by talking about the specific mechanisms uh, that we're proposing. One of these um, uses uh, Vickery Clark Groves enforcement mechanism to make uh, truthful revelation of values among the sellers uh, a dominant strategy or straightforward. And then there are some um, other potential implementations using other standard concepts from the auction theory literature, uh, one based on Bayes Nash implementation, and one based on the all pay auction, and another on the first price auction. And then I'll contrast these mechanisms with um, a class of mechanisms based on voting among sellers, what we call the ex plurality mechanism, uh, which will argue include just about every mechanism that has been used in practice for this problem and almost all that have been proposed in the past. Uh, I'll then talk about the um, connection of the holdout problem to public goods games and to Corneau's original collaboration problem, showing both how our mechanisms can be applied to those contexts, as well as trying to highlight the spe special um, structure of the holdout problem, which is very closely related to these problems, but which gave rise to our particular um, solution. And I'll conclude by talking about some potential directions for future research. So let me start uh, with Corneau's theory. The one, uh, there are a couple of elements of it which are very familiar to um, anyone in an industrial organization. Corneau's fundamental argument is that 
uh, someone monopolizing the production of a good will have an incentive to reduce the production of that good below the amount that's sufficient so as to raise the price and earn some profits off of that. Um, but he argued that um, that incentive to reduce the production of the good so as to raise its price will become small as the number of firms among whom the production of the good is divided grows large because any firm will only be producing a small fraction of the total quantity and therefore will only have a small incentive to try to raise the price. Um, on the other hand, Hugo Sonnenschein in 1968 pointed out that um, Cournot's collaboration problem in which there's a bunch of firms producing goods that are perfect complements in consumption has exactly the opposite structure. That is that each firm only receives a small fraction of the benefits associated with selling the good. And therefore, as the number of firms gets large, as the good is divided up into many complementary chunks, each seller will have very little incentive to restrain their price in order to keep the production of the good uh, vigorous because they only get a small fraction of the gains associated with the good being sold. And so eventually, um, uh, Ted Bergstrom in 1978 showed uh, that as the number of sellers gets large, this trade dwindles to zero because um, the, uh, each firm has little, very little impact on the quantity of the good being sold rather than on the price, and therefore that quantity will eventually uh, diminish to zero. Now, um, this logic was most famously not applied actually to Carnot's original problem, but rather to the problem of public goods by Paul Samuelson in 1954, um, who argued that uh, public goods, much like the perfectly complementary monopoly problem, are a situation where uh, however much of the public good is created, is shared by all people regardless of whether they've contributed uh, or not and um, automatically benefits all of them. And therefore, no individual will have much incentive to make a contribution because uh, each one of their contributions only makes a small impact on the uh, total supply of the good which is determined by everyone's contributions. Um, this free rider problem like Cournot's uh, collaboration problem, leads that as the uh, good is divided among many, many people, uh, very little of it can be provided. Uh, and this is also known um, quite commonly as the tragedy of the commons. Now, um, while there's a lot of deep intuition behind these results, and I think uh, they lie at the heart of what many economists think of uh, when they consider problems of coordinating among uh, many different people, um, there were very quickly some challenges to these fundamental ideas of Cournot, not just the collaboration uh, ideas, but even the monopoly and uh, competition. So um, Jules Dupuy in 19, 1844 pointed out that the monopoly problem can easily be eliminated if firms are just regulated and legally required to charge a price equal to cost, then there's uh, efficiency even if the firm is a monopolist. And um, Bertrand in 1883 pointed out that even if there's no government to do that, if there's just another firm in the industry who's able to commit to his price, that competition will naturally lead prices to be uh, driven down to cost. Um, and in 1919, uh, Eric Lindahl proposed a similar solution uh, even to the collaboration problem, but here in the context of public goods, he argued that if each seller is um, forced uh, in the context of collaboration to price at cost, that will solve the problem. Or in the context of public goods, if each um, member of the community to which the goods are being supplied uh, is forced to bear a share of the costs, 
equal uh, to the share of the benefits that they receive, then they'll know that uh, if they demand less of the public good, well, that will lead everyone else to contribute less. A little bit like uh, how on NPR, uh, if you make a contribution, often your contributions are matched. If you're only forced, forced to pay a share of the cost, you have a more efficient incentive to uh, provide the, um, to demand the good. And he argued that the fully efficient quantity could be supplied if the uh, prices were, uh, to each individual, their shares were just set correctly. Now, um, these seem to really undermine the basic uh, claims Corneau was making, but um, these counterarguments uh, were shown by a number of people to be somewhat fragile. So Paul Samuelson argued that Lindahl's point about pricing um, would require a whole lot of information on the part of the government. It would need to know exactly how much to assign to each individual uh, to pay as a share of the total expenditure. And Baron and Meyerson even challenged the more basic Dupuy cl claim that prices could be regulated down to cost. He argued that in order for the government to regulate prices down to cost, it would have to actually know what the firm's cost was. Otherwise, it would be in danger of putting the firm into bankruptcy by um, forcing them to charge a price below what it costs them to produce. And in fact, building on this, um, Meyerson and Satterthwaite uh, basically uh, vindicated Corneau's reasoning by arguing that um, the Corneau distortion basically has to exist any time that it's not completely ex ante sure that uh, a trade should occur. So suppose I'm selling potentially something to you. If we're absolutely certain that the maximum I value the good at is less than the minimum you could possibly value it at, we could just set the price halfway between uh, those points and we would both be happy to make a trade. But if that's not absolutely certain, if there's a chance that I could value the good more than you do, then one of us is going to have to be in put in charge of determining a price that's mutually beneficial to us. And um, whoever is put in charge of determining that price is going to have an incentive to reduce the chance with which the transaction occurs so as to shift the terms of trade in their favor. If I'm, uh, as the seller, put in charge of the price, I'll have an in incentive to try to raise it above the minimum I'd be willing to accept so that I can earn some profits, and that will reduce the chance that a sale takes place. If you're the seller, if, uh, if you're the potential buyer, you'll have an incentive to reduce the price between below the maximum you'd be willing to pay so that you can get some value from the trade, and that will reduce the chance uh, that a sale takes place as well. Um, and because there's this uncertainty on both sides of the transaction, it's inevitable that there's going to have to be some distortion. And it wasn't just in this monopoly context that uh, Myers and Satterthwaite's reasoning uh, vindicated Corneau's ideas, but more generally. So in the context of competition, um, it was shown that even a very uh, simple procedure, such as the double auction, would converge to efficiency gradually as the number of uh, participants on each side of the auction grew, uh, basically because their incentives to uh, distort the prices fall as the quantity sold by any one of them, uh, kind of with certainty, diminished, just as in competition. This is uh, basically equivalent to Bertrand competition, where the firms have different um, costs, uh, which are not known to each other. and. Um, this shows, in some sense, that Cournot's basic model of competition was right. He just didn't have quite the right formalism to uh, make his arguments uh, correct in the context of Bertrand competition. One would have to introduce the fact that different firms have different costs. Um, and in fact, it turns out that the rates at which uh, things converge to efficiency are basically the same as those predicted by Corneau's model, his uh, 
model of competition, everyone taking as others' quantities as given, was really robust to the introduction of these um, variable costs in ways that the Bertrand prediction was not. And uh, in the context of the collaboration problem, Maylath and Postelweight uh, also vindicated Cournot's argument. They showed that um, if we require the consent of all sellers in order to make a purchase go through, and uh, the values of the sellers are unknown, and the government doesn't supply any subsidies, as the number of sellers grows large, it becomes impossible for a sale to take place. And that's true under any mechanism you could possibly use, just like the Myers and Satterthwaite result. Um, basically because uh, as the number of sellers grows large, the potential for one seller to hold out becomes uh, prohibitively difficult. This is really the intuition I was um, pushing at the very beginning of the talk. And this is not just a consequence of the fact that um, one sellers might have an incentive to lie and say they value their land more than they truly do. Even if the government were just to make a take it or leave it offer to all the sellers, um, there's a fundamental tension between allowing sales to take place and preserving property rights. Because if everyone has the right to say no to that potential sale, um, the government, if it wants to have any chance of purchasing from all these people, is going to have to buy from each one of them with an extraordinarily high probability. And that's going to re require paying each of them close to the maximum they could possibly value their land at, uh, which is going to make it very difficult for an affordable sale to take place. Uh, and I think this contrasts a bit with a lot of literature about the holdout problem, which has assumed complete information and then proposed mechanisms which ensure efficiency. Those basically correspond to the same mis mistake, I think, that um, Lindahl was making. Uh, that is, it's true that if you um, have complete information, then you can just kind of regulate everyone down to cost. This is basically what's suggested by uh, a recent paper by Shapiro and Pincus, who suggested the government just make a take it or leave it offer to sellers, uh, and that this uh, would eliminate the holdout problem. Or an earlier literature on corporate acquisitions uh, by Bagnoli and um, by Bagnoli and uh, Lipman, which suggested that as long as every seller of a corporate stock is required to consent to an acquisition, uh, this can solve uh, the uh, holdout problem. But um, the, the problem with that logic is that it ignores the fact that we don't actually know how much everyone values their land at. And those types of mechanisms, therefore, will almost certainly require uh, paying an enorm enormously high price to every seller uh, in order for a trade to take place. So the fundamental holdout problem is not a problem of people lying about the values of their land. Rather, it's a much more fundamental mechanism design uh, problem that if there's all these complementary sellers, we're forced to pay them all near their maximum value, and that makes it very difficult for trade to take place. Um, so uh, we think this demonstrates a fundamental difference between auction design and design for the holdout problem, which is that auctions, as they get large, as there's enough participants, will just fix themselves. One doesn't really need to worry about the details of how they're designed. Whereas in the holdout problem, it's really crucial. Unless you have exactly the right design, unless you tr strike the right balance between preserving property rights and efficiency, um, as the number gets large, you're really doomed to failure. And yet, despite this, there's an enormously large literature on the auction problem, but almost nothing on designing mechanisms for the holdout problem. The one exception to that is a literature on public goods gains. Um, and those are obviously closely related to this problem. Because again, a public good benefits everyone. Uh, the sale of the um, land 
requires a cost to everyone in the community. But these um, mechanisms aren't really appropriate for uh, a practical solution to the holdout problem for a few reasons. Um, and these have led them not even to be applied to practical problems of public goods, much less to the holdout problem. Most of them is, assume either symmetric information uh, in the way that I was uh, arguing is unrealistic in this problem, or they have multiple equilibria, and um, the right equilibrium can really only be focused on if there exists uh, symmetric information about the costs. There's a very nice paper by Martin Bailey in 1994, uh, which really does a reductio ad absurdum on these problems, showing that if they, the mechanisms really worked as they are supposed to, you would uh, basically solve the Maylath and postal weight theorem, as well as a number of other problems in economics. So um, now there are a few public goods mechanisms which are more easily applicable, uh, particularly Vickery Clark Groves mechanisms, but they really miss some of the most fundamental issues in this problem, namely that it's really important that we make an effort to try to preserve the property rights of the sellers in the community. That's one of the main goals in the design of mechanisms for uh, land assembly problems, because the Constitution requires just compensation be paid to the sellers of land. Um, and Vickery Clark Groves mechanisms basically totally abrogate property rights and really make no attempt uh, to protect them. On the other hand, mechanisms that try to protect property rights, like the Bagnoli and Lippmann or Shapiro and Pincus mechanisms, um, suffer from the holdout problem. That is, sales almost never take place because the consent of all members of the community is required. Um, so our goal today is going to be to come up with some mechanisms that strike a reasonable balance between the competing goals of efficiency and the protection of property rights and are practical to use in real world problems, which we think is basically a totally open problem. Now we're gonna, even though our mechanisms really apply to public goods problems of a certain structure and to the collaboration problem as well, I'm gonna focus on the holdout problem for today, only talking a little bit about those other problems, because there's some special structure to the holdout problem, which particularly suggests the solution we'll give and um, because property rights are obviously really important in that problem in a way that they aren't in the other context. And I think that that combination of the special structure and the emphasis on property rights is really what led us to our um, approach and to the, the contribution that we're gonna make. So um, let me discuss a um, general model of the holdout problem that gives you a sense more precisely of what I'm talking about, there um, is a potential buyer of a plot of land who values only the plot of land in its entirety. So um, she views the land as perfect complements, uh, all the different parts of the land as perfect complements to her in consumption. And she has a value for that whole uh, plot of land which only she knows and she's going to submit uh, an offer for that land. The, there's going to be a mechanism she'll participate in, which I'll talk a little bit more later, and the mechanism recommends to her some offer to make as a function of what her actual value is. Um, then there's a whole community of sellers, and each seller has a value for her own sliver of the land, but not for uh, anything beyond that. Uh, that's her value VI, and um, she's going to report a reservation value uh, at which she'd be willing to sell the land, which will be related um, under the mechanism to her true value by some recommendation that the mechanism will make about what she reports uh, her value is for any given value that she receives. Um, now each seller is going to have a share of the total property. This represents the best guess that the mechanism designer or social planner can make about the ratio of her value 
to the sum of the total values in the community. Um, th that's kind of, as a theoretical matter, the way to think about it. As a practical matter, um, this can be determined in any way that's basically exogenous to things said by the buyers. And I'll talk about, in just a moment, in practice, some of the ways this can be determined, but they're actually quite straightforward and um, natural. Now, the better uh, approximation that this share is to the true ratio of the seller's value to uh, the total value in the community, the better uh, or more accurate are going to be the property right uh, protections that we're going to um, give. So that's going to be the key uh, dimension of give when there's imperfect information is going to be that the property rights in our mechanisms are going to be weaker. And what is this mechanism I'm talking about? Well, it's really just a transaction procedure. It's some rule for determining as a function of the buyer's offer and the seller's reports, both whether a sale takes place or not, and what payments are made between the seller, the buyers, and uh, the mechanism runner. And a really fundamental requirement for a mechanism is that it be self-financing. That is, that the total payments made by the buyer and sellers are a positive, a weekly positive amount. Because otherwise, there would be an enormous um, requirement both for external subsidies and potential for fraud taking advantage of the mechanism. People who don't even really want to have any transaction just uh, going through this process, receiving the subsidies, dividing them among themselves, and then undoing whatever has been done. And in fact, there's some work I'm doing with Jean Tirole right now on why you wouldn't want to allow that sort of uh, subsidy. A more ambitious goal, though, is that you achieve full budget balance. That is, that not only are there not external subsidies required, but there's also no money taken out of the community. OK. So um, now I want to discuss some uh, richer criteria by which one might want to judge mechanism. And one natural one is that it be straightforward. That is, that the strategy prescribed to the sellers be their optimal strategy regardless of what they think other sellers are doing and the buy what the buyer is doing. And the nice feature of that uh, kind of solution concept is that it means that you can honestly say to the sellers that X is in their interest regardless of what they think the situation is, which puts a very low burden on them in terms of having to think through the problem and figure out what their optimal action is. Um, a weaker requirement is that the uh, mechanism be implementable. That is, that the suggested strategies are optimal to the sellers, given the beliefs that we're going to assume or derive that they have about what other people are doing. Um, now, on the efficiency side, of course, the ideal goal would be full efficiency. That is, that all gains from trade are realized and no harmful uh, trades take place. But, but we know that that may require a really unacceptable abrogation of property rights. So there might be some sort of second best notions that we'd will, be willing to accept, given that it may be very difficult to achieve full efficiency. And a natural one of those uh, is what we call bilateral efficiency. That is that the um, amount of gains from trade realized are no lower than what they would be if there were just two people bargaining with one another. And this is basically, if a mechanism satisfies bilateral efficiency, it doesn't solve the monopoly problem, but it does solve the holdout problem and just convert it into a monopoly problem. And this is very closely related to Cournot's suggested solution to the collaboration problem, which was to merge all the firms together into one company uh, that will then be a monopolist charging the consumers, of course, that doesn't solve the monopoly problem, but it does uh, get rid of this much worse problem of trade totally drying up as the number of firms gets large. A more ambitious goal would be what we call asymptotic efficiency. That is, that as the number of sellers gets large, we actually get to full efficiency. And rather than con this corresponding to converting the holdout problem 
into a monopoly problem, it corresponds to converting the holdout problem into a competition problem, whereas the number of sellers gets large, things get fully efficient. Um, and uh, that's, in some sense, even better than converting it just into a monopoly problem, because we know um, how to kind of deal with the competition. We just need to encourage, uh, we need to make sure the community is sufficiently large. Um, on the property rights side, of course, the ideal would be to perfectly preserve individual property rights. That is, no one would ever be forced to sell below their subjective valuation for land, their land. This is kind of the most uh, uh, appealing first notion of uh, property rights protection and basically corresponds to what's typically called individual rationality, that everyone would be willing to participate voluntarily in the system. And you know, there's lots of reasons why we might think we want to protect some amount of property rights, both from an economic perspective, because we want to encourage investment that we think people might not be willing to make if they know their property rights can be abrogated, but also for more basic sort of legal and philosophical reasons. It's written into the Constitution as just compensation. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why we believe that taking away people's property rights is inappropriate from a philosophical perspective. Um, now, preserving individual property rights, however, is very difficult because um, we know that perfectly preserving individual property rights will guarantee, unless we have some external subsidies, um, that no trade will take place as the community grows large. So we might, again, be interested in some sort of second best notions of property rights that we could rel uh, reconcile with some notions of efficiency. So one of those is collective property rights. This is the notion that the community is never forced to sell below its total valuation. That is, well, no individuals, individual property rights are protected. The community as a whole's property right is protected. And there's some reasons why one might think that this is a reasonable second best notion. Uh, at least in some contexts, in the context of a, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the context of specific examples, but there's some cases where uh, for protecting investments or for satisfying legal norms, really it's the property rights of the community as a whole that are relevant and not of any particular individual within it. Second, a second more individualistic notion, but still not full individual property rights, is what we call approximate individual property rights. This is the notion that no individual should be forced to sell below their share of the share scaled up value of everybody else within the community. This is in some sense the best approximation we can get to the individual's value for their land without ask, actually having to ask them anything. So uh, one minus the share the, the value of everyone else divided by 1 minus the share times their share is kind of uh, as close of an approximation as we can get to that individual's property rights, again, without asking them anything. And I think that uh, we think that this, again, is a pretty reasonable second best notion of property rights, um, being able to maintain some observable but subjectively valued by the community investments that shift the shares but may be valued subjectively by individuals. And um, again, in the context of specific applications, I'll argue that it corresponds quite well to some natural legal or philosophical uh, notions. And finally, one thing that we might ask is that in some of these contexts, it's actually the buyer uh, rather than some other exogenous process that's asked to determine the shares that are given to different members of the community. And um, this uh, is pretty problematic if the buyer would have a systematic incentive to lie about what those shares are in order to try to reduce the minimum price at which he could uh, purchase the land. And so we might want to require that the um, buyer has an incentive, at least in some context, to truthfully reveal the shares of the land. So 
uh, the mechanisms that I, I'll be discussing in just a moment satisfy um, both of our second best efficiency guarantees, both of our second best uh, property rights guarantees. And uh, some of them will also be straightforward, uh, share incentive compatible, um, and some of them, but not others, will be implementable. Um, and I'm going to discuss those in a moment, but it's just useful to see that we're kind of able to satisfy all of the second best notions, but not the first best notions, because we know those can't be jointly compatible with one another. So um, the way we do this is by using a principle we call the concordance principle. And um, the real inspiration for that idea was that, as I discussed earlier, Cournot had all of these ideas that I think were really ahead of his time. Um, they, he didn't quite have the right context for articulating them, uh, but he had the right uh, basic notion. And so we thought um, we should go back and think more about Cournot's proposed solution to the uh, problem of collaboration and see if there was a way to apply that to the holdout problem. So what was the solution to the problem of collaboration? Well, again, it was to merge all of the collaborating firms together into one monopolist and then have them just uh, go about their merry way. And um, we view that as really involving two steps. When firms merge, they have some way to divide the revenue earned among all of the uh, subsidiary stockholders. Um, and and then they force each of those divisions to internalize the cost of any actions they take to other divisions. Um, this is the uh, uh, this is discussed extensively by Groves and Loeb in their seventy nine paper, where they talk about uh, ways to get firms to do that, divisions to do that. So, in honor of his theory of concorde producteur, which is the collaboration problem, we call this the concordance principle. Concordance is the uh, basic noun in English that uh, evolved from the phrase concor in uh, French. And it's basically very much analogous to uh, Cournot's suggestion. Namely, we're going to divide up any revenues earned by, from a sale among the sellers according to some pre-specified shares, just as the revenues earned by the conglomerate are divided up among the shareholders. And um, the sellers will be forced to pay Pigouvian taxes to the extent they have externalities that harm other members of the community. Uh, so let me describe just a little bit more formally uh, what, how this works. So the concordance principle says that an offer should be accepted whenever it exceeds the sum of the seller's values. Um, a seller will be said to exert no influence over the decision if their reservation value is exactly equal to their sh pre-assigned share of the offer, in which case, of course, whether the offer is accepted or not is determined by um, how it compares to the share scaled up reservation values of all other sellers. Any seller who chooses to exert no influence will not pay any taxes She'll just get her share of the offer if the sale goes through, get nothing if the sale doesn't go through, but she's never forced to pay anything. She may also, on top of that, receive some um, additional money, but she's at least guaranteed this payoff. And um, if a seller is influential, she may be forced to pay a tax for any externality that causes to others to encourage her to be truthful. Uh, and she's asked to tell the truth, whereas the buyer is asked to make the monopsonist optimal offer against the distribution of um, aggregate seller values, the sum of all seller values. So it's um, pretty easy to see that any concordance mechanism automatically uh, is bilaterally and asymptotically efficient. Why is that? Well. The decision rule used about whether to accept the offer or not 
is exactly that which the community, if it was all one individual, would use. And um, that immediately implies that its efficiency is exactly equal to that of a bilateral trade mechanism if the community as a whole were just bargaining with the buyer. Um, if there's some independence in the seller's valuation, then uh, the uncertainty about that total valua valuation dwindles as the number of sellers grows large. And thus, gradually, the buyer becomes perfectly informed about the seller's value, and we get efficiency as the number of sellers uh, grows large. And that uh, implies asymptotic efficiency. Second, any concordance mechanism protects both collective and approximate individual property rights, because on the collective front, the sellers could all get together and have all but one seller report just their share of the offer. Then the remaining seller could not possibly have externalities on anyone. Um, and, uh, and therefore, if that remaining seller just reported their share of the aggregate valuation, well, the community's um, property rights would have to uh, be protected because the decision would be made on the basis of the aggregate uh, value. And so they, the offer would never be accepted unless they were getting at least that. And they're not forced to pay any taxes. Uh, and so the community's collective property right is protected. Furthermore, every individual's approximate individual property right is protected because an individual can always choose to exert no influence, in which case the decision about a sale is based on whether the offer exceeds the sum of everyone else's reservation value over one minus the share. And so the land will never be sold unless the offer is greater than that, in which case the seller is going to receive at least her share of that um, uh, approximation of her value based on everyone else's. And therefore, her approximate property rights have to be protected. So um, before I get to describing particular mechanisms which implement this uh, principle, I want to talk about some of the potential applications of this framework just to bring home uh, how important I think it is in the world, as well as to show case uh, some of the ways in which the notions that I've just introduced uh, manifest themselves in the real world. So um, the two primary applications I've been talking about so far are land assembly and corporate acquisitions, and I'll start by discussing those. So um, problems of having to assemble land and dealing with the holdout problem arise in a really wide range of contexts. Um, sometimes, or perhaps most commonly, they arise for simple physical reasons, that you know, a bridge needs a contiguous uh, set of land in order to be built, and all the different people who uh, might, uh, whose land needs to be taken uh, or assembled in order for that bridge to be built uh, will have an incentive to hold out. Um, on the other hand, it can also arise for legal reasons. So in Mexico, there's systems of collective land ownership where no individual within, um, within a community is allowed to sell unless all members of that community consent so as to protect the collective rights of that um, community. On the other hand, uh, there can also be social and political reasons why these problems emerge. For example, in um, Rio de Janeiro, there are these beautiful mountaintop uh, real estate, which is owned by um, a bunch of, uh, which is really uh, dominated by a slum, but would be very valuable land if it was the, in the hands of upper middle class people. But that transaction hasn't really been able to take place because it would be necessary to evict almost all of the slum dwellers because um, the uh, potential upper middle class new residents wouldn't want to live in an area uh, where they were exposed to the violence that currently exists in Rio's favelas. And they wouldn't feel comfortable uh, avoiding that unless uh, almost all of the slum was removed. Um, and uh, the typical way that in the United States, at least, 
the holdout problem associated with this is solved is the government simply takes the land and pays a value based on the assessed value of the land, which is um, typically below what uh, anyone could possibly value their land at because they always could have sold their land at the assessed value. So the fact that they didn't indicates that it's below what they, the value is worth to them, what the land is worth to them. And there are really natural incentives for corruption in this situation because the government can you know, just announce that the land is blighted uh, many years before and use that as a way to drive down the property values and then uh, buy the land at these new reduced values uh, through eminent domain. Or uh, they can even get into league with the assessors to try to drive down the values. Uh, and it's much harder for the uh, decentralized community of sellers to influence that process. But on the other hand, I think assessments do give a pretty reasonable sense of the share of value held by any individual. I mean, not perfect, but a reasonable approximation. And so that seems a, a fairly reasonable way to go about assessing the share as we were talking about earlier. And um, land assembly has really played an important role, not just in the United States, but all around the world and at many different times in history. So um, the, uh, in the development of industry in England and France, um, the easier uh, mechanisms in England for assembling land are thought to have been a primary reason why England industrialized sooner than France did, because only 75% of landowners were forced to consent in order to enclose a piece of land into an assembly, whereas in France, universal consent was required. And um, in many developing countries where good institutions for dealing with the holdout problem don't exist, um, such as uh, Mexico, Brazil, Thailand, and other places, um, the holdout problem can be really severe, a severe retardant on development um, and potentially a source of significant uh, political conflict. And I think that a lot of the notions we've been proposing match up quite well with the example of land assembly. In fact, we're uh, inspired by it. Um, property rights, uh, almost everyone would acknowledge, are really important things to protect in this context. That's why they're written into the Constitution as requiring just compensation. But also our notions of approximate property rights and collective property rights correspond well in many contexts. So for example, in the Mexican system where there's collective ownership of land, it's arguable that our notion of collective property rights actually corresponds much better to what the government is trying to implement than uh, this notion that everyone should have to consent. And second, um, the approximate individual property rights, I think, really approximates better um, the notions coming out of Hugo Grotius's writing in the late 17th century, which really influenced the notion of just compensation, that no individual should have to bear a disproportionate share of the social costs of um, a project, uh, and therefore that a fair compensation is really the best guess that the society can make about what an individual's value is, which I think is actually much better approximated by our notion of uh, approximate individual property rights than it necessarily would be by strictly preserving individual property rights. Um, furthermore, our focus on efficiency matches up well with re recent Supreme Court decisions about the definition of public use in uh, property takings, uh, which tend to emphasize uh, efficiency. And again, the share notions that we were talking about can easily be based on shares of assessment or um, market value of the land. Even though these are imperfect, this is a fairly reasonable, uh, you know, practical um, and commonly used way to uh, think about these types of problems. Second, uh, in the context of corporate acquisitions, um, the values that sellers have for the land not being sold, for, sorry, for the company not being sold, is that uh, their shares in this company may be more valuable to them than uh, 
than any shares they could buy in the company once it's been acquired. And that can arise um, uh, as a result of the fact that they have some beliefs about the um, prospects of the company and they have some uh, you know, downward sloping demand for the uh, shares in that company because they're risk averse and don't want to bet too heavily on those beliefs. If the company is then taken over by um, another firm which wants to do something else with the company, well, the benefits that they can gain from that sort of consumer surplus of that investment uh, disappear. Um, and to protect these minority shareholders, rules typically require that when a company that's not planning to necessarily use the company's assets in the fiduciary interest of the minority shareholders acquires it, um, they're forced to buy the shares of everyone. Um, such provisions are often used also if a corporate raider is coming in to protect them from the free rider problem that would arise if the uh, buyers of the shares, sorry, if the current owners of the shares refused to sell and just benefited from the um, raiders' uh, activities uh, without having to um, sell their shares and thereby uh, raise the value of uh, every seller from uh, keeping their shares out from the deal and made it impossible for the company to be taken over. Now the typical procedure for dealing with this resulting holdout problem is to have either some standard as in typically in the US, United States for um, voting on whether the sale will occur or not among the seller, among the current share owners, or um, requiring that once a certain fraction of all the shares have been bought on the open market, the other uh, share owners are forced out at the price of the um, maximum, uh, the maximum price at which those uh, shares were purchased. Um, and I think that in the context of corporate acquisitions, uh, our notion of collective property rights is quite appealing from the perspective of um, investment incentives because uh, almost none of the investments in improving the running of the company are made by any individual shareholder. Instead, they're really made by the set of all shareholders together. And so the investments that need to be protected would be protected uh, by collective uh, property rights. Furthermore, the shares are very easy to assess. By law, they have to basically be the shares that any individual owns in the company. So um, these are uh, a couple of, I think, really important applications, but there's many others as well, including the settlement of disagreements over debt um, to avoid bankruptcy or, or liquidation, uh, spectrum reassembly. The FCC has recently been trying to reassemble parts of the um, electromagnetic spectrum to use for Wi-Fi, which are currently being used by uh, television broadcasters. And uh, maximally efficient Wi-Fi requires a large contiguous uh, chunk of spectrum. Um, this is actually something we've been talking to them uh, a bit about, potentially using uh, a mechanism like this. Third, um, patent. Uh, uh, in order for patent transactions to uh, take place efficiently because of the Corno collaboration problem, it makes a lot of sense to have um, all of a group of strongly complementary patents be owned by the same in, uh, individual or consortium. And um, uh, and therefore, this creates a sort of complementary goods holdout type problem that could potentially be solved by the um, patent office uh, forcing people into a mechanism like this. Art collections are another example of this. Uh, one funny example I heard about recently of that was that many of the frescoes uh, uh, at Monte Cassino were um, shattered in the Allied bombing. Uh, in World War II, and um, many uh, townspeople stole little fragments of the, um, of the frescoes, which uh, without them, the fresco is incomplete. And then each one of those individuals can hold up, potentially, 
uh, without some coercive mechanism, the um, government's assembly of those. In fact, Michael Heller has a whole book uh, which is called The Gridlock Economy, which is all about examples of the holdout problem and the uh, difficulties that it's created in a whole wide range of um, parts of the economy. Uh, and to be a little bit more quantitative about this, you know, it's really almost impossible to even guess uh, how large of a problem this causes, but despite the fact that it's almost impossible, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, so um, it seems that from the fact that there are 6,000 litigated uh, eminent domain cases in the United States every year, uh, and then there's a whole series of things that don't even get to that point, um, and other uh, potential land assemblies which don't take place because of the difficulty of making them happen. So just among those, uh, and the fact of the other examples that I explicitly gave, one can already come up with a, you know, somewhere in the order of hundreds of billions of dollars every year in potential land assemblies. Um, corporate acquisitions are usually on the order of about $2.8 billion, trillion dollars a year. And debt settlements on the order of about $1 trillion a year. Uh, now, those things are quite variable across the economic cycle. But when there aren't lots of corporate acquisitions, there tend to be lots of debt settlements. So the sum of those two things tends to even out uh, to about uh, $4, billion, $4 trillion a year. Um, and you know, if we assume that there's a pretty modest potential 20% gain from trade in the typical uh, acquisition, which corresponds to um, a 10% markup if we had linear demand, which has quite small potential gains from trade per markup. Um, and 10% markup seems very reasonable. Um, and then you also very conservatively assume there's only one quarter of gains from trade lost to the holdout problem, which is what would happen under monopoly given uh, linear demand. Linear demand being having very small dead weight loss and the um, holdout problem being much worse than the monopoly problem. Uh, we think this is a very conservative estimate. Even in that case, there would still be easily trillions of dollars in net present value uh, lost to dead weight as a result of the holdout problem, uh, which is on the order of about 10% of global GDP. Um, and this is compared to 1% that uh, Bob Lucas in 2003 estimated was the value of eliminating all economic cycles for the rest of, uh, of back uh, in history. Um, and uh, so I think this is a really large economic problem. Uh, and especially, you know, if you compare it to other problems to which market design are applied, not that these are small problems, but apl typical applications of auctions, matching, uh, combinatorial assignment, or other kind of focal market design problems in recent years, I think that it's pretty clear that this is at least on the same order of magnitude, if not um, significantly larger than those other uh, problems. Okay, so now let me talk about some of the specific uh, mechanisms that we're proposing which implement the concordance principle. And the simplest, um, you know, any the thing that really distinguishes all of these mechanisms is the taxes that they use to encourage sellers to tell the truth by internalizing the externalities they cost to others. Without those taxes, the mechanisms are not going to be implementable. No one will have an incentive to tell the truth. Um, and uh, that can be simply seen by imagining a community where there are two individuals. There's an offer made of $100. Each seller has 50% uh, share. Imagine one seller actually values their land at $75. Well, they'd have an, they don't want a sale to take place. They have an incentive to say that they valued their land at infinity to try to make sure that a sale never takes place. So something has to be done to restrain them from uh, lying like that. And a simple way to do that is to use uh, Vickery Clark Groves uh, enforcement mechanism. We know that Vickery Clark Groves 
will make things straightforward for the sellers. That's why we call this the straightforward concordance mechanism. So in the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism, everyone pays a Pigouvian tax based on the reports of others. We use that to calculate the externality they're causing. If they, um, as a result of their value, cause the sale to change relative to what would have happened if they had said that they wanted to exert no influence, they're forced to pay um, this, which is basically the harm that they caused others relative to what would have happened in that case. Um, and they receive a tax refund, which is given by this formula. I'll talk about exactly what this formula is, but it ensures that the, um, that the mechanism is self-financing, but still returns some of the uh, taxes that they were paying. <coughs> and the rest of the mechanism follows from the concordance principle, that is the offer is accepted if it's greater than the sum of the reservation values. Everyone's asked to tell, all the sellers are asked to tell the truth and the buyer is asked to make the monopsonist optimal offer against the distribution of total seller value. So this straightforward concordance mechanism is straightforward for sellers um, by the same proof of the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism being straightforward for sellers. It's um, self-financing because the refund is set up so that it will never return more revenues uh, than are earned in taxes. It's implementable because the buyer is recommended to make his optimal offer against the sum of the seller's values, which will be what determines whether he gets to buy the uh, land or not. And so, th of course, it's going to be in his interest to do that. And um, there is a sense in which um, this is really the only mechanism of this sort. So in particular, um, we actually extend Green and LaFont's 1977 theorem um, to the case when there are only two outcomes, sale or no sale, which is not covered by their theorem. And that shows that any straightforward concordance mechanism is exactly the mechanism I've described except that it might have a different strictly positive refund than the one we, we have. That is, uh, we used a particular refund, but there could be another refund that's used. And the refund we propose is the maximal refund, which is consistent with self-financing and not discriminating among the sellers. But um, the problem is, as a result of not discriminating among the sellers, it really, in practice, only um, returns a small amount of revenues. In fact, if everyone's shares are exactly the same, it'll never return any revenues because everyone can always state that they have a value which um, causes whichever side is currently winning, sale or no sale side, uh, to have no one that's pivotal. And then uh, they'll receive no uh, uh, refund uh, as a result of that. So. If instead we discriminate um, in favor of people who receive low shares, there's a, a couple of benefits to that. One is, you know, some people receive low shares because they actually have a small share of the value, but also some people randomly receive a lower share than they should have received. And we'd really like to smooth over that, if at all possible, um, to try to uh, improve their property right protection. Um, and uh, help them out for the harm that they've caused by being estimated to receive too low of a share. Um, second, if we give more of a refund to people with low shares, because those people have less capacity to influence whether a sale takes place or not, it turns out we can safely redistribute more revenues to them than we could to other people. Now, for... Um, large communities of sellers, we could actually return all the revenues if we wanted to um, by randomly selecting some members of the community to be exempted from participating in the mechanism and then just refund to them uh, all the revenues that are uh, earned off of everyone else. This is pretty inequitable in certain ways. So it might not be the best way to uh, go but it's um, something that one might consider adding on if it was really important 
to return lots of the revenues. Now, despite any refund that we have, and despite the fact this is the only straightforward concordance mechanism, it still has some problems that are traditionally associated with Vickery Clark Groves. Namely, it has um, a imperfect, uh, it's obviously not perfectly balanced. And in fact, the degree of taxes you pay depend on what other people say. So there could be substantial incentives for collusion, as is well known in the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism. And um, the sellers are forced to make all these kind of extra payments to ensure that they're doing what they should be doing. And this is in some ways unappealing, particularly if we were in a community of sellers that has um, you know, budgets, they're not such wealthy people, uh, et cetera. Well, I don't find that sort of argument that compelling, given that they, you know, they do have a house that they could use as collateral to make these payments. Nonetheless, um, this, this whole notion is a bit unappealing. And in particular, given that how much I end up paying in taxes depends not just on what I say, but on what others say. There's quite a lot of risk in how much I end up paying. And, and that's maybe not, not so great either. So, so some of these problems could be eliminated if um, the uh, externalities that people were forced to compensate for were not calculated based on what other people said, but on some information that we had um, as a government social planner. And that, um, if that's possible, uh, we can run a mechanism that is uh, more appealing in a number of ways. Um, in, in particular, uh, if we know the distribution of sellers' values, we can just calculate the average externality that any given report that the sellers make causes. Um, now, of course, that requires on the base that the um, mechanism designer have some, you know, beliefs about what the values are and that this be shared with all of the sellers. And this violates, you know, a basic principle of mechanism design, namely Wilson's doctrine. And um, in addition, the incentive properties, uh, even if we did know this distribution of values, would still depend on the sellers being risk neutral and therefore viewing the paying their average externality as the same as paying the externality they actually cause in each case. But given these caveats, uh, we can consider the mechanism suggested by this, which we call Bayes-Nash concordance. Namely, everyone pays their expected externality to everyone else rather than their actual externality and receives a refund of their share of the expected externality based on everybody else's report that everyone else pays. And the rest of the mechanism is determined by the concordance principle. This is not straightforward because if others don't actually report their values, well then I'm not actually paying my externality, I'm just paying this expected externality. Um, and so I'm not always going to have an incentive to be truthful, but if I believe everyone else is being truthful, I have an incentive to do so. So its incentive properties are not so bad, it's still implementable. And um, it's perfectly budget balanced, because now I can return my share of what everyone else actually paid, not the minimum they could possibly pay, because I have no influence on what they pay, and so that wouldn't lead to any um, problem with incentives. Second, we can actually preserve strict proper collective property rights. That is, it's not just possible for the community never to have to sell below their total value, but in fact, they never end up selling below their total value. Um, and uh, the, because taxes that I pay don't depend directly on what other people say, I might have much lower incentive to collude with other people to try to reduce my tax payments, and that might reduce the collusion problem. And because I pay the average of the taxes I'd pay, and not just um, uh, their actual value at any particular time, I um, might reduce uh, the problems that people have of potentially busting their budget or facing risk because sometimes they have to make some payments, sometimes others. But 
the, I think the real problem with this mechanism is it's really unclear how to actually implement it in practice. We need to know the distribution of values, and it would be hard to go to the city of New London and say, what do you think is the joint distribution of all the values that people might have for their land? It would be hard to get them to take a stand on that. And if it was wrong, or if their beliefs differed from those of the actual sellers, uh, things would be pretty problematic. Now, um, the real problem in practically implementing the Bayes-Nash concordance mechanism is um, that there's some function of the difference between the seller's reported value and their share of the offer, which uh, determines uh, how much tax they need to pay. We'd like that to be the average externality. If it were the average externality, we know that it would be zero if they exerted no influence, that is, f of zero is zero, and that it um, increases with how far they are from exerting no influence, that is, um, when this is negative, uh, the, the tax is decreasing. When it's positive, the tax is increasing. Um, but we don't know what f actually is. So one natural approach would just be to plug something in for x, which satisfies the properties we know it must have, uh, but isn't actually the right function. For example, we could plug in the absolute value of x. This corresponds to everyone uh, paying the surplus that they would earn from getting their desired outcome if they were to actually get that desired outcome. And, um, that is in turn equivalent to everyone stating whether they want the sale to occur or not to occur and paying the um, and paying any amount that they want to try to get their outcome with whichever side has a greater pool of money assembled winning uh, the uh, tournament essentially and this uh, we refer to as the all-pay concordance mechanism because it's very similar to the all-pay auction. People put money on the table, whoever has the biggest pool of money wins. Um, and it retains all the benefits of Bayes-Nash concordance over Vickery Clark Groves concordance, uh, over uh, straightforward concordance, uh, namely, um, namely its budget balance, and it has, um, it might help reduce the collusion problem, but uh, it doesn't have the advantage of Bayes-Nash concordance that it's actually incentive compatible to tell the truth. Now that's a problem because you might think that that really undoes, undoes all the um, actual benefits of the concordance mechanisms because in practice, it may not actually behave like uh, we were claiming it would behave in theory. And in fact, it's not even clear what exactly the benefits of this, uh, what, what exactly the equilibrium of this mechanism would be like in practice. Uh, we haven't been able to calculate any equilibrium, uh, and it's not really clear how it would perform. Now, um, it might be that the outcome of this mechanism would be the same as um, the outcome of the straightforward concordance mechanism. We're not totally uh, sure, but there might be some argument like the revenue equivalence theorem and auction theory, which says that even though people wouldn't have the incentive to be truthful, the outcomes that end up arising are basically as if they were truthful. But, you know, we really don't know. And, you know, the revenue equivalence theorem rests on the notion that um, the allocation is the same in the different cases. And that's why the payments are the same. Here, we're trying to claim that the allocation would be the same uh, because the rules are somewhat related to what the rules should actually be. So, who knows? Um, Another approach along these lines would be to make the payment more like in the first price auction. That is, that people would pay their surplus from, uh, from getting the outcome that they want, but only if they actually get the outcome that they want, not in every state of the world.
Um, this is a lot like uh, the first price auction, so we call it first price concordance. Um, and it has basically the same properties as all pay concordance. Um, so I, we don't discuss, I won't discuss it too much. So I think, you know, while these um, mechanisms are kind of interesting and potentially have benefits over uh, the straightforward concordance in the same way that um, the Bayes-Nash concordance would, I think much more would need to be understood about their equilibria before you'd actually want to uh, put them into practice. Now, uh, I'm going to contrast this with a totally different class of mechanisms, um, which are based on voting over whether the uh, offer should be accepted. In particular, um, these mechanisms have, again, the buyer making an offer, the sellers having shares. But now the decision rule for whether the offer should be accepted or not is if the um, total number of shares consenting to a sale exceeds some threshold uh, fraction x. And if the offer uh, is above on a share weighted basis, the minimum possible value that could be held by anyone in the community. Um, and if a sale occurs in, under this thing, under this arrangement, everyone receives their share of the offer, but there's no other money that changes hands. So there's no sort of externality taxes being paid here. And the buyer makes the monopsonist optimal offer, but not against the sum of all the seller values, but against the minimum winning value given this decision rule, which is something like a distribution of order statistics of the uh, buyer distribution, but now weighted by shares. So um, w in the paper, we argue that basically almost everything that's been used in the past for uh, the uh, holdout problem, and in fact, many of the things that have been proposed recently are really special cases of this. So in the case when x is equal to 0, the um, government just pays everyone the market value, which is the minimum value people are potentially willing to accept. We know that they don't, um, they aren't willing to sell for less than this because otherwise they already would have sold by revealed preference. Um, uh, so it really, eminent domain is equivalent to the x equals zero x plurality mechanism. For x in the middle range, um, Basically, this is the sort of mechanism that's used typically for corporate acquisitions where all the sellers on a share-weighted ba basis vote on whether they want to accept the offer or not. Um, and it's also uh, equivalent to recent suggestions by Heller and Hills and others based on um, some very old approaches to land assembly, such as those in England and in um, Japan in the middle part of the 20th century to have sellers vote on a share weighted basis on whether to accept the buyer's offer or not. And x that are very high or near 1 are really just equivalent to decentralized bargaining. That is, um, everyone needs to accept the offer. Everyone's property rights are preserved. Or um, Shapiro and Pincus's uh, 2007 suggestion that there just be a um, offer made to all of the sellers uh, that is take it or leave it um, by the government. So basically, all of the standard mechanisms fall into this X plurality class. And I think that the reason for, we think that the reason for this is um, not uh, because people are just stupid. I think there's actually some very um, substantial benefits of uh, this class of mechanisms. First of all, it's very simple. People can understand it very easily. Um, it's always budget balanced. It's always straightforward for the sellers. And it involves no extra, um, you know, kind of payments that are unappealing or money floating around the system. And it protects, by definition, the property rights of X percent of shares. And at least in large populations, if, x is, if the x quantile of the share weighted distribution is set equal to the mean, it's basically like the concordance mechanism, because in this case with high probability, 
the um, sale takes place if and only if it's above the uh, total value of the community. But the problem is, it's pretty hard to know how one could possibly choose x correctly so that it hits the mean of the distribution. Um, and if it was uh, wrongly chosen, you can get lots of uh, inefficiency and poor protection of property rights. If x is too low, then you're basically like eminent domain. You're abrogating property rights and you're having inefficient sales take place. If x is chosen too high, you're kind of back to the holdout world. You're going to do a good job protecting property rights, but it's going to be really inefficient because you're going to have a very high threshold for these sales taking place. Um, now, I, uh, we think that there's lots of really interesting theoretical issues raised by this sort of mechanism. For example, um, the actual uh, quantity that determines whether the offer takes place, the thing against which the buyer makes his monopsonist optimal offer, is a fairly complicated object because now there's share-weighted voting going on. So what exactly the um, quantity is and how its distribution is related to the choice of shares and the distribution of valuations is a pretty interesting uh, theoretical question. Second, you know, choosing the correct x or figuring out how you, one might do that in practice we think is a, is a really interesting problem, especially given that in small populations the distribution of this is not the same as the distribution of any particular quantile of the um, distribution. It's not the same as the, any particular um, population quantile of the distribution of values. It's an empirical quantile of the share weighted distribution of values, which is you know, an interesting object. And uh, particularly uh, challenging, we think, is that in small populations, there's going to be some non-trivial distribution of that uh, number. And that's going to create a Meyerson Satterthwaite distortion. The buyer will have an incentive to reduce uh, the probability with which a sale takes place to raise his uh, to lower his offer in order to try to uh, make more profits. And um, that might actually make it optimal to make x lower than it would otherwise be so as to try to undo that efficiency, inefficiency. So I think there's a number of really cool theoretical problems raised by thinking about these types of mechanisms despite the problems that we think exist with them. So now let me give a comparison of the um, mechanisms we've been talking about so far. This uh, table basically summarizes everything we've said, and I don't expect you to be able to read it from there, but, um, but it appears in the paper, so you can look at it more carefully. There are some clear dominance relationships that I think uh, exist between these different mechanisms. So first of all, I think straightforward concordance is definitely superior to the most naive implementations of Vickery Clark Groves in this context, as have been uh, suggested by um, Tideman and Plasman in a, a recent, recent paper. Um, because they're able to preserve these um, approximate individual property rights that we think are so useful, whereas naive implementations of Vickery Clark Groves are just going to totally abrogate uh, property rights. Um, similarly, we think that intermediate but low values of x are almost certainly better than um, you know, x equals 0 as an uh, under eminent domain, because at least these preserve some degree of property rights. And they're actually more efficient than having a really low value of x, because this encourages inefficient taking. Um, now, in the trade-off between intermediate values of x and higher values of x, this really has to do with how much you want to trade property rights for efficiency. And in the trade-off between um, you know, straightforward concordance and Bayes-Nash or uh, all price and first price concordance, I think it's going to be very difficult in practice to implement Bayes-Nash. But if you could, it would almost certainly be better than straightforward concordance. On the other hand, Straightforward concordance, uh, on the other hand, the all price and first price concordance uh, mechanisms might be superior to straightforward concordance, 
but we need to know a whole lot more about how both as a theoretical matter their equilibria are and whether in practice people doing this for the first time can actually find something close to that equilibrium or whether we could recommend to them something that might be close to that equilibrium. So um, our guess is that in the long term all pay and first price might actually be superior or maybe even Bayes-Nash but in the short term until we've understood those better uh, straightforward concordance is likely superior. Um, in the uh, comparison between the concordance mechanisms and the um, X plurality mechanisms, I think our basic view is that um, potential users of these mechanisms might fall into three categories. The first is people who um, have pretty high stakes situations where property rights are pretty important and they um, want to strike a reasonable balance between those two and they're willing to have somewhat more complicated or less intuitive mechanisms in order to achieve those goals, in which we case think there's a really strong case for doing something like the straightforward concordance mechanism. A second group of people are people who want to strike a reasonable balance between efficiency and um, fairness, but uh, really think that the sellers are not sophisticated enough or the politics is not flexible enough to allow them to um, strike the optimal you know, balance between those. And for those people, I would think you'd want to kind of get something close to this optimal X value as, as best as you could. And then there's going to be another group of people for whom property rights are just really overridingly important, much more important than efficiency, in which case I think, you know, X plurality with a high X or just allowing decentralized bargaining is going to be um, the best approach. Um, so now I want to try to tie what uh, I've been talking about so far back to a more classical or bit perhaps better known literature on public goods. Um, and public goods, as I mentioned earlier, have a very similar structure to the holdout problem. They're goods which benefit everyone regardless of what that person does if they're created. And this is very much like the holdout problem, which if the land is taken, it's going to hurt everyone uh, for losing their land regardless of what exactly they do. Um, so if you just switch the signs on uh, the model I talked about earlier, basically it's equivalent to a binary um, quasi-linear in money uh, public goods uh, setting. Um, and in that setting, property rights are equivalent to the mechanism uh, being voluntary for people to participate in. And getting perfect shares and therefore uh, having an efficient um, property rights protecting mechanism would be essentially what is aspired to by Lindahl pricing. And therefore, what we've done corresponds basically to Ted Bergstrom's 1979 notion of pseudo Lindahl equilibrium, in which people pay based on an approximation to their true shares, but the quantity is determined by what they would demand at their actually uh, true shares. Now, no one has proposed a general implementation of this notion, and we think that the reason is because there was a focus in that literature on a very general problem, allowing for income effects, a really wide range of different shapes of valuations for the public good, and um, general, not uh, binary public good games. Uh, and um, also, those mechanisms weren't very focused on actually giving, quote unquote, practical solutions to particular problems. They were interested in this sort of general uh, problem of public goods games. Uh, and to the extent they were interested in more practical mechanisms, they were focused on voluntary, uh, they weren't very focused on voluntary participation, but it's not as important of a constraint in raising money for public goods as it was uh, in the holdout problem that I proposed. Um, and the particular mechanism that we proposed, or Bergstrom's notion of pseudo-Lindahl equilibrium, is not nearly as appealing in this broader 
uh, context as it is in the special case of the holdout problem we talked about. And we feel lucky uh, that all that came together because I think it gave us an opening for making our contribution that might not otherwise have existed. Now, um, our problem is also quite closely related to Cournot's collaboration problem with um, risk neutral sellers uh, and quasi linear and uh, constant marginal cost. Consider the case of a firm in Cournot's problem with constant marginal cost. They earn profits that are the quantity of the goods sold as a function of price times the markup of price over cost minus any taxes they pay. And um, this is very closely related to their payoffs in the holdout problem on average because the quantity as a function of price can be seen as the um, probability with which the sale takes place as a function of their price, uh, the aggregate price, times the amount that they receive less the value that they have minus any taxes that they pay. The key difference here though is that the probability with which the sale takes place is determined by the total value that the sellers uh, express. That is that the sellers are basically now in the driver's seat in the collaboration problem. The buyers are the ones who see the posted price who get the, fix, you know, the uh, take it or leave it offer. Um, and so there's a natural extension of the straightforward uh, Vickery Clark Groves concordance mechanism here, um, namely um, the sellers all agree on uh, a measure, they all agree on a demand or they somehow go out and structurally measure uh, that demand and uh, all receive shares. They then all submit a cost, and the um, social planner chooses the uh, monopoly optimal price against this demand, given the total cost expressed by the sellers. Each seller then pays, um, gets paid their share of revenue, but pays a tax that's equal to how much they reduce the total profits made by all other sellers as a result of not having chosen to exert no influence by just uh, bidding their share of the scaled up uh, costs of everyone else. And they receive a refund that's analogous to what they receive in the straightforward concordance mechanism. Now, this has the analogous properties to the um, straightforward concordance mechanism, but it has no asymptotic efficiency. And why is that? Well, the sellers are the ones who are being put in charge of making the offer to the buyer. And the sellers are not getting more informed as the number of sellers gets large the way that the buyer is getting more informed as the number of sellers gets large because he's able to average out over their idiosyncrasies. Um, the uh, buyer's value has the same distribution no matter how many sellers there are. And so there's no diminution of the inefficiency as the number of uh, sellers gets large. So there's still bilateral efficiency, but no asymptotic efficiency. Here, property rights becomes basically bankruptcy proofness that no one is forced to um, sell at a price below their cost, uh, which might cause them to lose money and, and potentially go bankrupt. And all of the other mechanisms that we proposed or discussed have natural uh, applications in this context. You could make people uh, along the lines of Bayes-Nash pay their expected externality. Along the lines of all pay, they could pay their total profits. Along the lines of first price, they could pay their share, sorry, they, they could pay uh, their surplus from having shifted the optimal price uh, away from what it would have been if they had uh, acted like their share of everyone else's costs. And in X plurality, you could kind of put their costs on a line and um, choose the cutoff where X percent of shares lie below that and then use that cost properly scaled to determine the optimal price. And these could also be applied to public good games, 
with a very particular structure, uh, but with continuous choice of expenditures, where all the sellers differ only in a multiplicative scaling of some known concave uh, value that the sellers have, uh, sorry, that the community members have for using the public good, it might be possible to generalize the basic notion we have, but not kind of the exact structure of the holdout problem to more general public goods problems by imagining that someone exerts no influence if they say that their value is always their share of the expenditure. Um, but it's pretty clear that that sort of a thing is not literally going to have the same payoff structure of the holdout problem. And so uh, we chose not to discuss the mechanisms corresponding to that at, in as much detail in the paper. OK, so now I want to wrap up. Um, and uh, just to summarize, I think that our paper made two contributions. First, we tried to bring the holdout problem to the attention of the market design community by um, connecting it to a bunch of problems that are perhaps better known, as well as to this older literature uh, that exists on uh, starting with Cornell. And second, we wanted to use those ideas to try to take a first stab at practical solution of these problems. Um, some things that we're planning to do for the final draft of this paper, uh, which will be the one after the current, one is that uh, we'd like to have a, a better refund based on discriminating in favor of people with low shares. Second, uh, we'd like to have some asymptotics about what happens to that refund. Uh, we'd also like to have some, at least, simulations of what behavior seems to be like in simple cases in the all pay and first price concordance mechanisms to have some sense of what their equilibrium are like, as well as maybe thinking a little bit about collusion and formalizing the risk that people have and the potential violation of their budgets that might occur uh, under the straightforward concordance mechanism. Second, um, moving beyond this paper to other things we're thinking about working on for this project are um, trying to do some experiments in which we figure out what the best way to explain the straightforward concordance mechanism is, as well as how to, um, to see how people actually would behave in the all pay and first price concordance settings. Um, second, we're um, trying to talk to the uh, Federal Communications Commission about potentially implementing uh, one of these mechanisms um, for assembling the spectrum. And we're trying to think about some of the legal, philosophical, and economic foundations for the notions of property rights that we're putting forward as alternatives to individual property rights. And we're working with some people from law on that. And um, we're probably going to write an op-ed advocating this as a potential solution for eminent domain. Um, there are also, I think, some very natural directions for future research extending what we've been working on, including trying to figure out strategies for implementing Bayes-Nash concordance in practice, how to measure the distribution of values, um, trying to figure out in some of these issues about what the right X is in, X plurality, in the X plurality mechanism, um, as well as trying to measure much more rigorously than the uh, really rough and ready uh, back of the envelope calculations we did, what actual losses in practice to the holdout pr problem are. Uh, we'd also like to work on trying to improve the, um, it would also be nice if people could work on trying to improve the mechanisms we put forward. There's some pretty natural ways to do that. One is to think about cases where the property rights aren't fully held by the community, but might be partially held by the government or the buyer. This is um, useful for a couple reasons. One is that in some taking settings, we think that actually the government is not just taking the land from the individuals who have the property rights to it, but actually partially has the property rights to it itself. This is true often in regulatory takings and other cases. And we know that in the cases when the buyer has partial property rights, the buyer um, 
will have a better incentive to uh, make an efficient offer for the property. There's a recent paper by um, Segal and Winston talking about that. And therefore, it might um, actually make sense um, to uh, put some property rights into the hands of the buyer so as to um, encourage efficient sales. Um, second, uh, we don't take extremely seriously this problem that sellers may not have a sufficient budget to make the payments that they need to make. But um, to the extent that that is a problem, the tools developed by Milish Pai and uh, Ricky Vora in their 2009 paper for auctions uh, could be uh, potentially useful. Um, and that would be an interesting direction to extend things. But beyond just the uh, mechan you know, tweaks on the mechanisms we've proposed, um, it would be interesting to think about whether there are other concordance mechanisms using other enforcement mechanisms on top of the basic concordance principle, as well as non-concordance mechanisms other than the ex plurality mechanisms that um, still preserve some notion of property rights and might offer efficient solutions to this problem. Um, and thinking about what other notions of property rights might be appealing in this setting is an interesting question. Um, third, there's a bunch of issues that arise with imperfect complements. One particularly interesting one is if there are many different groups uh, of properties that might be assembled to build a mall, say. In that case, when there's competition among those groups, you should be able to exploit some of that to improve on things. For, first of all, one might just think if there was Corno competition among groups of perfectly complementary uh, sellers, um, how large would the number of competing groups relative to the size of the um, of the of each group have to be in order for efficiency to arise? So there's a sort of basic price theory problem there, and then that could be extended to mechanism design under the optimal mechanism. What would those ratios have to be before for you know you to get to efficiency for there to maintain sort of a steady level of distortion? or for there to be uh, a holdout problem that makes things arbitrarily bad. And then one might actually want to try to use some of those insights to come up with practical mechanisms that extend what we've done to those sorts of contexts, which could be really practically important um, in the real world, because often if you're going to build an oil pipeline, say, you could either build it through one route or through another, and you want to make those different routes compete to have the land bought from them to try to improve the efficiency. Um, what is a right mechanism for that case is really interesting, especially when there's one individual who might say overlap uh, between two different competing groups. So anyways, uh, thanks so much for listening to this uh, presentation, and I hope you'll take a look at the paper.